If you're driving on Route 59 just outside of the city of Warren in Warren County, you'll eventually pass by the Kinzu Dam, which is on the Allegheny River. The dam, which was initiated in 1960 but not completed until 1965, was built in order to control the flooding of the Allegheny River as well as to generate hydroelectric power. The consequence of the dam's construction was not only the Allegheny Reservoir, also known as Kinzu Lake, but also the slashing away of one of the oldest existing treaties with the American Indians and the displacement of the corn planter kingdom. John Abiel, more commonly known as Corn Planter, was born to a Seneca Indian mother and a Dutch fur trader and gunsmith in the 1730s. His father's family included a grandfather who had been an early political figure in New York State. Despite this, Corn Planter was raised predominantly by his mother and her clan and the Seneca people. The Seneca themselves were, at this point, part of the Six Nation Confederacy which is more commonly known today by the French title of Iroquois or Iroquois Nation. Around 12,000 common era, the Seneca, Oneida, Mohawk, Cayuga, and Onondaga established a partnership with one another, composing the original cooperative five nations whose domain extended over large swaths of present-day New York State as well as Pennsylvania's northern tier. In the decade prior to Corn Planter's birth, the Tuscarora people entered into the Confederacy, thus becoming the modern Six Nation Confederacy of the Iroquois people. The maternal lineage of many Indian tribes meant that Corn Planter was recognized as a full member of the Seneca people. The clan which he was born into, the Wolf Clan, I kind of have to go off onto a side thing here for a second. I know it sounds really hokey to believe, too cowboy and Indian of a name, but but trust me when I say this is legitimate. The clan into which he was born into, the Wolf Clan, well anyhow, Corn Planter was born into the Wolf Clan and many of his relations would be renowned for their diplomatic prowess. Corn Planter first established himself during the French and Indian War, also known as the Seven Years War, as a military leader among the Seneca people who would align themselves with the French whose presence in Nouveau France had been somewhat more tolerated by the indigenous nations in the region. Corn Planter had even taken part in the Battle of Monongahela, which saw General Braddock and his superior English forces lose in a battle and by this way fail to seize control of Fort Duquesne located uh, at Pittsburgh's uh, confluence of the Ohio, Allegheny, and Monongahela rivers. As the American Revolution broke out, the Iroquois nation opted for neutrality, and this was encouraged by agents from both the colonial and loyalist factions. However, as the war intensified, the same governments began to make deals in order to secure the Iroquois for war. Despite continuing to argue against entering the European People's War, Corn Planter and an uncle Gosutha were outvoted at the 1777 Oswego meeting in Oswego, New York. This found four of the Iroquois nations, the Mohawk, Onondaga, Cuyahoga, and Seneca, siding with the British forces. The Oneida and Tuscarora decide to side with the revolutionaries. Corn Planter and another Seneca man, sometimes known by the name of Old Smoke, were established as the military leaders of the Iroquois people. And it was in this role that Corn Planter would find himself in the eastern part of Pennsylvania, participating alongside British forces in acts which would become known as the Wyoming Massacre. The Wyoming Massacre found British commander John Butler reporting that nearly 1,000 homes had been burned and about 300 revolutionaries and settlers murdered. This was then followed four months later by the Cherry Valley Massacre in New York State. These two events being connected and being so involved, I'm thinking I'm just going to have to talk about them sometime in the near future. The short story for today is that the Wyoming Massacre, which occurred in the Wyoming Valley of Northeastern PA, 
And since the colonialists and the Iroquois were accused of various atrocities beyond the pale of acceptable warfare, including the murder of non-combatants, Corn Planter and the other Iroquois in high standing who were present at Wyoming denied the accusations set against their people. In the months ahead, the colonial revolutionaries went about attacking and raising Iroquois villages, including Tioga. The Iroquois retaliated to Cherry Valley, where infighting among the British commanders may have further riled the nearly 300 Seneca troops present. While attacking the Cherry Valley, the death toll was not as high as it had been in Wyoming, but 30 non-combatant settlers on what was then the American frontier were murdered outright. Many people blame the ranking British officer Walter Butler, I'm not sure if he has any relation to John Butler of the Wyoming Valley Massacre, with incomplete or intentional malicious neglect. The governor of Quebec refused to see uh, Walter Butler from that point forward. The actions at Cherry Valley as well as the general ramping up of violence on the frontier battle lines would find the American revolutionaries retaliating by way of the Sullivan Expedition. Authorized by the military commander of the revolutionary forces, uh, one George Washington, and led by the eponymous Major General John Sullivan, the Sullivan Expedition was comprised of approximately 5,000 soldiers marching west from Easton, Pennsylvania on June 18th, my birthday, and through much of the Iroquois land in a seek and destroy operation which targeted Seneca and Mohawk villages in particular and winter food storage sites specifically resulting in the starvation of many of the Iroquois nation during the winter of 1779. As a result of this, some of the Tuscarora and Oneida tribes, which had declared allegiance to the American Revolution, changed colors and went to join the others allied with the British. The Sullivan Expedition would essentially break the Iroquois nation. The Treaty of Fort Stanwix, signed by Corn Planter following the American Revolution, would cede Iroquois lands to Pennsylvania in what would become known as the Last Purchase. The boundaries created by the Treaty of Fort Stanwix would be used in subsequent Treaty of Fort McIntosh at the site of present-day Beaver in Beaver County. The Treaty of Fort McIntosh would go to appease western tribes including the Delaware and Mingo, who also had claims on the lands in western and northern Pennsylvania. Corn Planter's reasoning for signing the treaty involved his vision of the growing power of the new American government as well as his anger towards the way the Senecas, loyal to Great Britain through the revolution, were disregarded by the British following their defeat. Corn Planter's signing of the treaty would not make him particularly popular among the Iroquois at first, as resentment over the frontier battles had not soon been forgotten. He had also signed the Treaty of Canandaigua on November 1794, this treaty, ratified by George Washington, would be one of the longest treaties honored by the American government, honored but ultimately infringed upon. The Canandaigua Treaty would effectively secure Iroquois land at New York's southern tier, some of which is maintained today. The treaty was authored in part by the federal government in the hope that by securing the land for the Iroquois, thereby preventing New York settlers from further encroaching upon the land, would thus prevent the clans from joining the western confederacies of tribes such as the Delaware, who would occasionally make attacks on the American western front such as at Fort Franklin in Venango County, a specific fort which Corn Planter himself uh, would travel to in order to warn the post there of a talk of impending attack. The land that was ceded to the Pennsylvania Commonwealth in these uh, two treaties, that of Stanwix and McIntosh, would constitute what would be known as the Last Purchase and would become Butler, Crawford, Elk, Cameron, Clarion, Forrest, Jefferson, Lawrence, Mercer, Potter, Venango, and Warren counties. It would also compromise parts of Allegheny, Armstrong, Beaver, Bradford, Clarion, Clinton, Erie, Indiana, and Tioga counties. That's 
21 counties in all, leaving Pennsylvania with the borders which we maintain today, excepting only the Erie Triangle, that triangular bit of Erie, which was purchased in 1792, the same year the Pennsylvania government granted Corn Planter 500 acres in Venango County at the site of present-day Oil City. This was done in recognition of his aid in establishing peace among the Iroquois and the American people. In 1796, Pennsylvania gave to Corn Planter the Corn Planter Tract, which consisted of 1,500 acres along the western bank of the Allegheny River in Warren County, just south of the New York border. Before the century was out, nearly 500 Seneca lived in the corn planter tract, which was given to corn planters people by the state forever, quote. Corn planter continued to establish himself as a leader of the Seneca as well as a supporter of the American government, and he even attempted to inject himself now as an aged man into the War of 1812, but was ultimately disappointed when his help wasn't really wanted, though younger Seneca men from the tract would volunteer in the war. In 1818, he sold the 500 acres that had been given to him at the site of present-day Oil City and was in contention with Warren County over back taxes on the 1,500 acres which had been given to him in that county. Corn planters stated that the land, which had been an award of sorts from the Pennsylvania government, could not be taxed based on those grounds. And after some fighting, Corn Planter's stance was held up in court and the county backed off. Corn Planter died on February 18, 1836, in the two story house in the town that bore his name along the banks of the Allegheny. He was the last great Indian leader of Pennsylvania. As per his wishes, his grave was initially unmarked, but the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania would erect a monument at the site in 1866. That monument reads, quote, Gwent Wahi, the corn planter, John O'Bale, alias corn planter, died at Corn Planter Town, February 18th, AD, 1836, age about a hundred years. Chief of the Seneca tribe and the principal chief of the Six Nations from the period of the Revolutionary War to the time of his death, distinguished for talents, courage, eloquence, sobriety, and love for his tribe and race, to whose welfare he devoted his time, his energy, and his means during a long and eventful life." End quote. And I apologize uh, for getting the uh, initial uh, name there probably mispronounced. It can't be helped. In C. H. Sipes' 1926 book, Indian Chiefs of Pennsylvania, there is a letter reprinted from the Venango County paper uh, known as the Democratic Arch, a paper which failed to outlast the 1840s. In the article, the uh, writer discussed Corn Planter in his old age and having seen him, and I'm going to read that article here, if bear with me. I once saw the aged and venerable chief and had an interesting interview with him about a year and a half before his death. I thought of many things when seated near him beneath the wide spreading shade of an old sycamore on the banks of the Allegheny. Many things to ask him, the scenes of the revolution, the generals that fought its battles and conquered the Indians, his tribe, the Six Nations, and himself. He was constitutionally sedate, was never observed to smile, much less to indulge in the luxury of a laugh. When I saw him, he estimated his age to be over a hundred years. I think a hundred and three was about his reckoning of it. This would make him near a hundred and five years old at the time of his decease. His person was much stooped, and his stature was far short of what it had once been, not being over five feet six inches at the time I speak of. Mr. John Struthers of Ohio told me, some years since, that he had seen him nearly fifty years ago, and at that period he was about his height, roughly six feet one inch. Time and hardship had made dreadful impressions upon that ancient form. 
His chest was sunken, and his shoulders were drawn forward, making the upper part of his body resemble a trough. His limbs had lost their size and become crooked. His feet, too, for he had taken off his moccasins, were deformed and haggard by injury. I would say that most of the fingers on one hand were useless. The sinews had been severed by a blow of the tomahawk or scalping knife. How I longed to ask him what scene of blood and strife and thus stamp the enduring evidence of its existence upon his person. But to have done so would, in all probability, have put an end to all further conversation on any subject. The information desired would certainly not have been received, and I had to forgo my curiosity. He had but one eye, and even the socket of the lost organ was hid by the overhanging brow resting upon the high cheekbone. His remaining eye was of the brightest and blackest hue. Never had I seen one, in young or old, that equaled its brilliancy. Perhaps it had borrowed the luster of the eternal darkness that rested on its neighboring orbit. His ears had been dressed in the Indian mode, but all the outside ring had been cut away. On the one ear, his ring had been torn asunder near the top and hung down his neck like a useless rag. He had a full head of hair, white as the driven snow, which covered a head of ample dimensions and admirable shape. His face was not swarthy, but this may have been accustomed for the fact that, also, that he was but half Indian. He told me that he had been at Franklin more than eighty years before the period of our conversation, on his passage down the Ohio and the Mississippi with the warriors of his tribe, on some expedition against the Creeks or Osages. He had been a man of peace, and I believe his great characteristics were humanity and truth. It is said that Brant and the corn planter were never friends after the massacre at Cherry Valley. Some have alleged, because the Wyoming massacre was perpetrated by the Senecas, that corn planter was there. Of the justice of this suspicion, there are many reasons for doubt. It is certain that he was not the chief of the Senecas at that time. The name of the chief at that expedition was Gin O Quato, or He Goes in the Smoke. As he stood before me, the ancient chief in ruins, how forcibly was I struck with the truth of the beautiful figure of the old aboriginal chieftains who, in describing himself, said he was like an aged hemlock, dead at the top, and whose branches alone were green. After more than one hundred years of the most varied life, of strife, of danger, of peace, be at last slumbers in deep repose on the banks of his own beloved Allegheny. During the 1930s, the Depression-era U.S. government was damn crazy for dams, and many of the iconic dams such as the Hoover Dam were constructed during this era. In that decade, the Flood Control Acts of 1936 and 1938 would pave the way for the construction of the Kinzu Dam on the Allegheny in an attempt to protect the cities along the river's shore from flooding, as well as to generate hydroelectric power. The Kenzu Dam would not move forward, though, for another 20-some years. The century following Corn Planter's death found his descendants and other Seneca people living on the tract. His last surviving direct descendant was the artist and World War I veteran Jesse Corn Planter. Jesse, who, due to the contentious attitude of the federal government towards the American Indian people, was not, nor were the other Seneca or other tribes across the board, recognizes American citizens with the right to vote and other rights of citizens until 1924. Regardless, Jesse was awarded the Purple Heart, but returned home to Warren County to find that his family, parents, siblings, nieces, nephews, had died during the 1918 influenza epidemic. His own death in 1957 would mark the end of Corn Planter's lineage, as Jesse Corn Planter expired so too, according to the state, did the corn planter tract the 1,500 acres in Pennsylvania and the sites of the Seneca towns of Kinsua and Corridon. The area was taken over by the Army Corps of Engineers. The towns raised and more than 600 people were relocated to homes on the New York Reservation. That reservation itself would lose 10,000 acres of the Canandaigua Treaty land 
also taken up by the Army Corps of Engineers and later further divided by the construction of New York's Route 86 directly through the Indian lands in 1964. Those who had been removed from the corn planter tract lost land which their immediate ancestors had lived on for the better part of two centuries, and they were given a house in return. The cemetery, which contained the remains of corn planter and other Seneca, were relocated to higher grounds. The Seneca people made appeals to then President John F. Kennedy, asking for him to honor the treaties as well as to consider rerouting the river itself, which may have been a less expensive alternative than the Kinzu Dam. In a letter from August 1961, President Kennedy addressed the Seneca people. Era, dear Mr. Williams, I fully appreciate the reasons underlying the opposition of the Seneca Nation of Indians to the construction of the Kinzu Dam on the Allegheny River. Involved are very deep sentiments over the loss of a portion of the lands which have been owned by the Seneca Nation for centuries. I therefore directed this matter be looked into carefully and that a report submitted to me on the basic issues involved. I have now had an opportunity to review the subject and have concluded that it is not possible to halt the construction of the Kinzu Dam currently underway. Impounding of the funds appropriated by the Congress after long and exhaustive congressional review and after resolution by judicial process of the legal right of the federal government to acquire the property necessary to the construction of the reservoir would not be proper. Moreover, I have been assured by the Corps of Engineers that all alternative proposals have been suggested, including the so-called Morgan Plan No. 6 have been thoroughly and fairly examined and are clearly inferior to the Kenzu project from the viewpoint of cost, amount of land to be flooded, and number of people who would be dislocated. In addition, the need for flood protection downstream is real and immediate. The cessation of construction would, of course, delay the providing of essential protection. Even though the construction of the Kinzu must proceed, I have directed the departments and agencies of the federal government to take every action within their authority to assist the Seneca Nation and its members who must be relocated in adjusting to the new situation. Included in the items, I have directed the executive departments and agencies to consider are 1. The possibility of the federal government securing a tract of land suitable for tribal purposes and uses contiguous to the remaining Seneca lands in exchange for the area to be flooded. 2. A careful review of the recreation potential resulting from construction of the reservoir and the manner in which the Seneca Nation would share in the benefits from developing this potential. 3. A determination of whether any special damages will be sustained because of the substantial proportion of the total Seneca lands to be taken. And 4. Special attention and assistance to be given those members of the Seneca Nation required to move from their present homes by way of counseling, guidance, and other related means. In the event the legislation is required to achieve these objectives, I have asked that recommendations be prepared. I hope you will convey to the members of the Seneca Nation the desire of the federal government to assist them in every proper way to make the adjustment as fair and orderly as possible. I pledge you our cooperation. Sincerely, President John F. Kennedy. This was to... Mr. Basil Williams, President, Seneca Nation of Indians in Salmonac, New York. The removal of the Seneca from the corn planter tract would mark the end of the American Indian lands in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And today, there are no reservations in Pennsylvania, at least not that I can find uh, according to federal government maps and recognized tribes. Many of the Seneca would regard the negation of the corn planter tract and the construction of New York 86 directly through the Seneca lands as further evidence of a government that was uninterested in the Seneca people until they had something it wanted. There was a personal dislike for Kennedy in particular. 
and I read the words of a former leader of the Seneca people who was in high school during Kennedy's assassination. When the assassination was announced, he stated that most of the American kids were crying, but many of the Seneca students cheered, some of them still reeling from the recent loss of their childhood home. And resentment still exists up in Salmanac, New York, and the surrounding Seneca lands over the, the dam and over Highway 86. A lot of people felt it was callous. In Kennedy's letter, it talks about giving more land uh, to compensate for what had been taken, the acres that had been taken from the Seneca and the treaties that had been slashed at for the construction of the dam. However, that never occurred. And many people felt that they were being told to get over it and that the teachers they saw and the people uh, around town who weren't of the tribe who were leasing land on the the reservation were uh, effectively confused by their being so disrupted by the displacement. Today you can drive along Route 59. If you were to do so and leaving from Warren heading north by northeast, you'll come to the dam on the eastern banks just several miles outside of town. Beyond that, extending for more than 20 miles into New York is the so-called Kinzu Lake or Allegheny Reservoir. Past the Klondike gift shop, there's a road called Sugar Run Road, also known as 321. It's on your left. You'll drive on this until it comes to a T, and you'll make another left, this time onto West Washington Street 346. Shortly before you encounter the border with New York State, and by shortly I honestly mean like the length of two football fields, you'll see a sort of paved road that leads into the woods onto your left. If you turn onto that little road, you'll creep through the woods and it opens up with the view of the reservoir and here is the final resting place, perhaps, of Corn Planter. And I say perhaps because it is not certain whether his remains were relocated or not. It's known that many of the graves were not moved from their initial site, which was flooded to the construction of the dam. The monument to him is there, though, and it looks out onto land that was once taken and then given back in thanks and then taken once more out of comfort.